Well, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the second conversation, second conversation for Plancestry Conversations. Can you let me know if you were here last night? Can I just see how many? Well done. <laughs> That's terrific. It was a great night, I think, and a great way to start uh, the festival. Uh, can I uh, firstly uh, acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land, the Jagera and the Turrbal people, and um, on which their ground um, this is taking place. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Deborah Murphy, who is the executive producer of Clancestry. She's with, the, with us tonight in the audience. Um, and uh, it's really um, Deborah and Rhoda's incredible work that have brought this festival around, uh, brought this festival on. Um, my name is Judith McLean, and I work here at QPAC. I'm the scholar in residence. Um, and I learned from an indigenous friend of mine uh, many years ago, a woman called Christine Peacock, that uh, one of the uh, best things you can do um, when you're working with people, and I use this with all my corporate clients, is to tell you that I was born in Bowen in North Queensland. Uh, my dad was a grocer at the local grocery store, and my mum was a home mother. And uh, immediately, um, you know a lot about me, and uh, you'll, I'm sure you'll feel safe <laughs> because I've told you that I can weigh things up and make sure that things finish on time. Um, uh, <laughs> I, want to, um, I want to start with a little quiz. Um, and it really, it's for the white fellows in the audience. OK, so um, I want you to raise your hand if you have ever spoken to a black person. Can you raise your hand and keep your hand up? I want you to, I want you to keep your hand up if you have ever, ever had a cup of coffee with a black person. A cup of something. A cup of something. <laughs> a cup of tea, cup of beer, whatever. Okay. I want you to keep your hand up if you have ever been out for a meal with a black person. I want you to keep your hand up if you've had a cooked dinner and had a black person over to your home for dinner. I want you to keep your hand up if you've had a black person to stay. Very good. Okay. That's, have a look around. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. When you do this exercise in a, in a non, uh, in, in a non-Indigenous uh, uh, meeting, you usually find that the hands have all gone down. Okay, one of the things about tonight is that we're going to have an hour with two wonderful, wonderful Indigenous women. And I apologise to them from the outset um, in trying to um, talk about their, to talk about their places of origin. Bowen's pretty easy when you um, have to say where these two come from. Um, Leanne um, Buckskin, who's going to be the interviewer, flew in from Adelaide to do this for us um, today, so we thank you for that long journey. Leanne is a Naranga Wirungu Wajabaluk woman from South Australia in Victoria. I hope it was okay. Um, in an historic appointment last May, Leanne became the first female chair appointed to the Australia Council's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Board since its inception in 1973. Quite an achievement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, she's a plethora of important achievements behind her. Adelaide Fringe, Adelaide Festival, Come Out, and her current role is as manager of Kaklu Youth Arts, uh, community programs there. Um, but more than that, um, she's a great friend of Rhoda's, so we couldn't think of a better person. And thank you for coming all this way. Rhoda. Rhoda is a uh, bun Bunjalong, uh, Widjabal woman um, from northern New South Wales. And we learned over dinner last night that she uh, actually, we live on her land between Warwick and Stanthorpe. So that was a, a lovely thing to learn. Um, I have to say Rhoda was very, very reticent about doing this and we really had to twist her arm and say, no, Rhoda, um, people are interested in you as a woman, you as an Indigenous woman, you've had an extraordinary career and we're all interested in each other's stories. So um, I take responsibility for pushing her very hard, but she has been, she's had deep misgivings about it. So um, we were, um, I've been fortunate to get to know her over the last few months and when I was um, preparing to, for what I was going to say this evening, 
Um, I found a quote from an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, and it was by a, a host, a colleague of Rhoda's, um, his name is Gavin Jones, and he, he listed amongst um, the qualities that he most admired about her was her humility. And he said this, people see this amazing person who's achieved all these things, but they forget where she came from. We're in for a treat this afternoon, this evening. I can tell you it'll be highly entertaining and deeply moving um, and as we trace and trace uh, Rhonda's life, please, uh, Rhoda's life. Please welcome Thank them you. both. Thank you, Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for uh, journeying um, into QPAC this evening to, to hear this uh, conversation with Rhoda. Uh, and um, I'm hoping that um, as I flew in, I brought some of the desert weather with me. Um, <laughs> I was, at the last minute, the taxi was waiting for me, and I was running around the house, and my dog was jumping around, and I'm going, quick, find an umbrella. We usually have five in the house, so I haven't had to pop it open yet. <laughs> But um, certainly, um, you know, in terms of the floods that are happening over here and, um, you know, certainly a point of conversation in South Australia where, you know, we're at the other tail end of the, the Murray mouth and incredibly dry. And um, so seeing all the water um, across this land was extraordinary to see. So let's get into a conversation with Rhoda. Um, start right at the beginning. Rhoda one of four children. Your father, Frank, um, was a, a minister uh, for the church. Um, met your mother, Muriel. Talk about your mum and dad. Okay, so my father is Frank Roberts, Jr. Uh, there's Frank Roberts, Sr., that's my grandfather. There's also Frank Roberts, um, who was known as Francis, who was our first Aboriginal Olympian to go to an, be selected for an Olympic Games. There's many Frank Robertses now. Um, yes, my mum and dad met in the church. My father had returned from um, training uh, with Martin Luther King in the um, Oral Roberts Tulsa, Oklahoma Theological College. And so he came back with the, the talk of civil rights and so forth. Oh, actually, he did that later. We were already born. See, I'm already... Look, I, I'm actually really quite nervous because one of the big things is blackfellas, you don't, you know, you don't want a big note and, and talk about yourself. So, mm. Judith, thank you. But yeah. that's why I was a little bit hesitant because it's not... You know, I don't really talk about myself. But anyway, so... <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> um, so, mum and dad met in the church. My mother was from a middle-class family... Uh, a white family with Irish. Her grandmother had come out when she was 10 from Ireland. And my father was a very strong Bundjalung man. He had grown up on Kabawi Mission and Cabbage Tree Island, um, which is a small island on the river system of northern New South Wales. We were quite fortunate. A lot of... When the protection board came in and rounded everyone up, and when the cedar cutters came through, we, we were known as the big scrub and we had a lot of rainforest. So they actually had almost another 50 years before that full affront of colonisation. And then they were rounded up and placed onto the island systems. And so Cabbage Tree Island was where a lot of our people went. Um, so yeah, so they met in the church and fell in love. And poor dad, he was 36 years old, mum was 26, no, even younger I think. And um, there was 14 years difference between them. And it was the first time when he went to my mother's house um, to meet her parents that he'd ever seen an electric light switch. Wow. Because mm. it was shed, you know, yeah. they didn't have power. So they met mm. in the church. Was that uh, in Sydney? Um, because at one point your father goes down to study theology and so they meet in Sydney. Yes, Dad was at Woolwich in um, North Sydney, over near Hunters Hill, and he walked to meet my mother, and he, because he was quite poor, so he wanted to impress her parents. With, yes, so they met in the church, but he wanted to impress her parents, so they had the suits of the day, you know, with the three little white um, card that looked like a hanky, <laughs> and he had that, but because he couldn't afford shirts, he used to just put the tuck of a collar... So he had a jacket on, but he didn't actually have 
a shirt. He just had the, the mm. bib bit. And of course it was so hot and he didn't have any money so he walked all this way and so he said he's trying to break out that thing to mop his brow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it reminds me of the film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, um, so how was <coughs> your father received? I mean, we're talking about a time where, you know, consorting with Aboriginal people was, you know, it was illegal. There was a whole range of legalities around white people and black people mixing. How did it go with your mother, Muriel's family, bringing a black man in for dinner? Yeah, very interesting because of, you know, mum's standing in the family, it was regarded as you should, my nana used to say you should only marry your own kind in the right class structure. But of course my granny, dad's dad, would say you should only marry your own kind in the right skin structure. So it's quite interesting, these two old ladies, poles apart, mm. had very similar ideas about their offspring and I think, obviously, they could see that there would be issues later in life. My mother at the time had been doing a lot of work with um, African communities, and she felt that she had a theory that if you, had a, if you fell in love and you had a child, it didn't matter what colour, as long as you gave them the tools of life, everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. And they were in love, but I think my nanny and poppy, that's the white side, they did tend to look at this man because... Although a lot of people don't think I'm a black fella, when you see my father, I don't think there's no mistaking that he's a black fella. He's got one of those big noses, <laughs> you know. So I think it was quite a shock that this very black man walked into their house and was watching everything mum did, because, you know, Nan would have the three forks and the three knives and all that sort of... So he didn't know what... So he just watched and took mum's cue. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. So from Sydney... Yeah. ..they go... Back to Bunjalung country, your father's missing country. Mm. How's your mother received? Well, in see, the mum had obviously been reading these books about the deep south. I think she watched Gone with the Wind a few times. So when <laughs> dad talked about Cabbage Tree Island and this amazing place and, and Kabawi, where they had a sugar, co a sugar cane co op, she's thinking plantation, right? And of course, she rocks up to the Mish and takes one look at Dad and says, there's no way my children... They weren't married or had children by this date, but there's no way my children will grow up in this environment. Mm -hmm. So it was quite interesting. But she understood why Dad needed to be back. He had a lot of community obligation within his own family structure, yeah. and, so he, and he was very homesick. He needed to be on country. Mm. So they moved back, and my nana and pop bought them a house in Lismore, in the very flash area of Lismore. <laughs> yeah, so I, I read it's a very middle class area and that would have been unheard of to have Aboriginal people living within that environment. Yes, um, it was in, you know, an area of Lismore that, you know, the doctors and the lawyers, and where we were there, at that time, it was all farms. Um, <clears throat> but it was really about, my mother had this theory that, you know, the facade and they will never box you in if you always destroy the image and give them the unexpected. She used to always say, outclass them. And so it was almost like, here we were with this gorgeous house on a bit of land, it was fantastic, but we actually had no money and she was cutting up apples to live on for three meals a day, but, you know, the facade was great. <laughs> so we go to the 1970s. Yes. And um, your dad's away somewhere um, doing some work with the church and your mother goes off to church, takes you kids, and the minister turns around to your mother and says, what's a white woman bringing these dark children in here? And turns around to, to her and says... Um, that you all were the spawn of the devil, the spawn of mixed blood. Well, with that, your mother turns around and says, well, I've come to worship God, not to hear your bigotry. Mm. And I mean, what an extraordinary lady. Um, My poor mum. Because mm. she was quite a religious person, very kind person, 
it was a really big thing for her in the 40s to start going out with this man and then getting married in the 50s, you know. And um, church to her was really her social network and outlet and in those days, you know, women raised the kids and went to church. And we'd been brought up in the church. Um, and so I think it must have been terribly hurtful for her to have a minister who was actually, in hindsight, I actually think he had Alzheimer's at the time, mm -hmm. and I think his bigotry started to show. But she stood her ground, and we got up in the middle of church, and all the old biddies looked, and my mother, you know, I could see she was very upset. She was crying, in fact, and she said, we came to worship God. You don't have to worry. My children and myself will never come back here. And Dad, meanwhile, had been away because Dad, one of Dad's dearest friends was a gentleman called uh, Pastor Doug Nichols, who later became governor, the governor oh, of South, South Australia. Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, they had... that Uncle Doug used to go out and they do all these bush church weddings, funerals, all that sort of stuff. So they were actually out bush doing the funerals at the time because um, a lot of Aboriginal communities wanted Aboriginal people. And Dad, he was religious, but he was very spiritual, so he used to do a lot of his sermons in language as well. And so, yeah, it mm -hmm. hurt a great deal. And when he came back, he said, well, now um, not all people are like that. And then we had this argument and discussion about the kindest people to us are usually the ones who are coming out of the pub on a Sunday and not at church. And they're really kind and they don't treat us badly and they're better people. So Dad then said to us, you have to make the decision whether you ever want to go back. And I went, yay, no more mm. Jesus ever mm. again. And that's, that's the way it was. It was and you didn't go back. So go back. in terms of um, your siblings, had they kept a connection to the church or they also didn't go back? No, no more Jesus for any of us. We <laughs> <Okay>. were out. <laughs> but oh God, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, throughout this conversation, we are also going to see some wonderful footage that Judith's um, um, presented. So I think we might even go to a bit of footage now. Thanks, Judith. I can't tell you how many times Lois or I would be told that we should remember who we were. We were mission blacks and we should not think ourselves so uptown and we should remember our place. That one of the greatest fraud perpetuated against the native inhabitants of this country Dad did so many firsts in his life. He was never one to want that national attention. He was just a community person who really lived for his community. You know, when we were kids, he'd go, all right, Saturday, we're going to Evans Head and we'd be there ready to go to the beach. And 10 o'clock would come, he'd go, oh, look, I just got a nick into town, I'll be back and then we'd go. One o'clock, we'd be sitting there, watching the road, waiting for his car to come. Two o'clock, we'd get the phone call. Look, uh, I'll come back soon. We won't make the beach, but I'll take you to the pool or I'll take you down the river. And five o'clock had come and he'd finally come home. And my poor mother had to deal with us crying and saying it wasn't fair and all the rest of it. So, let's progress to 1967. Yes. Um, it's a referendum. And what's happening in the Roberts household around this time? I wish I could remember the jingle for the referendum, but you will remember there was the Aboriginal yes vote to see mm -hmm. that we would be counted on the national census for Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. And um, Dad was very involved with Fakatsi. He was one of their regional members. And it was a time in our lives where, um, you know, in our kitchen, dining room, on our front veranda where all the meetings occurred, you know, there'd be Joe Mc Uncle Joe, the late Joe McGuinness. There'd be Faith Bandler, Dulcie Flower, Ujuru, Nana Walker. Just a variety of people would be having these meetings about the referendum. And so I was eight years old, and um, or maybe nine, and um, we had to go out. Dad felt that the community needed to know how this vote was going to go. So we, I think they were yellow forms, and we had to fold them. And so we did this big thing of who could do the highest stack and then we'd have to go out into the community and stand in the Lismore shopping block and go, hello, and hand it to people shopping, black and white and everyone. 
and uh, yeah, so the referendum, I guess, was for us a time where we heard our parents continue those political discussions that they were always having around the dinner table. Mm -hmm. At 17, you decide to go to Sydney to become a nurse. What was the motivation behind becoming a nurse? I didn't really want to become a nurse. I actually wanted to be a journalist, mm -hmm. but of course, day and time and you know all that it wasn't going to happen so during our high school period my father was very particular that he felt the only way that you had to give back he was very he was such a big we talk about it now but he, he was such a man about you're a bunjalung woman kabawi and cabbage tree island are your roots everyone laid down their lives or did things so you could have an education in 1963 in lismore the band was lifted so my cousins could attend high school, 1963. So dad was always about education. And he felt one of the greatest educations you could get was through volunteering. So we were all made to volunteer at some particular thing during our whole high school period. So I volunteered as a candy striper. Do you know what a candy striper? No. What's a candy striper? It must have come from America, but we used to wear a white shirt and a pinafore that was candy striped, red and white. And I actually think the first time I went, I loved it because I did it for the food because you would get a free meal at the hospital canteen and I thought it was brilliant and you get dessert. <laughs> so I think that's what made me go back initially. But it was really scary because, you know, I'm like this, you know, 13-year-old kid who has to go in to these white people and mm. write their letters for them, talk to them, you know, that sort of mm. thing, comb their hair, feed them. So they were, you know, like little nurses' assistants, so to speak. And so I did that through my whole high school period. And then in fourth form, I left school. And so I wanted to go on, but my family couldn't afford it. And my teacher... I had one particular teacher who told me I could, I could write, and he would get me a scholarship, and, and I was told that I had dreams and high and ideas, and it was never going to happen, I had to do something real. So, okay. I went nursing. From a, a learning perspective, I loved it, I was really wanted to learn, I, I really wanted to go to university, I really wanted to be a writer, so I was going to do anything it took to fulfil that dream. That was quick. Um, yeah, so I went to Sydney and became a nurse. And see, I was really skinny in those days. God. <laughs> so how long were you a nurse for? I was a nurse for 14 years. So I trained at Canterbury Hospital in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to work. Um, yeah, I was 21 there. That was my 21st. That was a very sad time, actually, because... Three days after that photo, my sister had a major car accident. Lois, your identical yeah. twin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I went and then I worked on Hayman Island. This is before it was the flash Hayman Island. This was when it was the old resort. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I went to London and trained to do another certificate at the Westminster Hospital in London. Wow. And then I came back to Sydney. How long were you in London for? Uh, I was away for a period of six years. So I worked in London, used it as a base. I worked in Italy, looking after unconscious Italian people in their homes because they don't have a social welfare system over there. And so when they're unconscious, it didn't matter that I couldn't speak Italian. And they were rich families and it'd be to look after their grandmothers through the night or whatever, you know, make sure they were breathing and, you know, do the sucker, clean out their mouths and all that. And I worked in Greece as well doing nursing. And then at the Plakia, at the American pub, serving beers to Australians and English people who couldn't understand why they had to eat masaka because where was the English food? So, yes, interesting. <laughs> Anyone been to Greece will know what I mean. So, the accident happens with Lois. What happens? So my sister was a hairdresser. She'd gone off to be a hairdresser. I'd gone off to be a nurse. Um, my sister was very different to me. We were very close. We were twins, but we were really chalk and cheese. Mm. 
And so she was very um, gregarious. She was amazing. She, was, she got the looks. She actually got the brains as well, but she just didn't use them. She didn't apply herself, really. But she if she's got the looks, you're identical twins. Yeah, no, so but she, she did look better. <laughs> she did. Because at the time, I was a bit, as you can see, I was a bit daggy. I didn't really wear makeup and stuff like that. And mm. she introduced me to all this. But she was the sort of girl, she was very materialistic, actually. So her and a girlfriend would go out. You know, she drank. I didn't drink. She smoked. I didn't smoke. She smoked Yandi. I didn't do that. She drank rum and cokes. I thought that was appalling. And she went to pubs and was a groupie to Big Mozzie and various bands on the North Coast. And then she proceeded to have affairs with the band members who were married. I, of course, was still a virgin and couldn't believe that she... Mm. And I'd worry about her and go, oh, my God, he's got a panel van. You know what they do in the back of panel vans? Don't go out with him. And she'd just look at me. So... I would come home on my nursing holidays and my sister would open my bag because while I was a dag, I actually had good taste in clothes. She'd take out the clothes she wanted to wear. I'd stay at home and clean her house because I was very anal and put all the cl clothes in colour coordinated things. Then study and her and a girlfriend would come home, you know, at one in the morning, pissed, bring out the bong and I'd be mortified. <laughs> And that's, and you know, and she was fun-loving, jumped up on tables, partied, did the whole works. She, um, so we're really different. Mm -hmm. She guided me in many things with sexual activity and various other things as you grow up. Gave me some really interesting advice, <laughs> bizarre advice, which of course I fell for. And then she had a car accident on her way to work because she was seeing one guy but that particular weekend she was coming to Sydney because she had another guy and she woke up and the guy turned up on the doorstep and she was in bed with the other guy and, you know, running late. So off she drives um, to Casino, which um, was quite a distance to go and uh, she was a terrible driver, I think, because she talked a lot while she was driving, you know, <laughs> just lead foot. And sadly, um, her vehicle ran off the road. Well, there were scratches of a yellow car that had run her vehicle off the road, which I think was the other boyfriend. And so she was lying um, in a ditch, unconscious. The most ironic or saddest thing is my brother was working on a farm and he drove the opposite way and must have passed without seeing the car in the ditch. Oh and when she was found, they didn't give her very much time. It was actually a, an incredible turning point mm. for me. Mm because she did everything for me. I was quite shy, um, but my father thought that she was the best thing in the world and that I really, he never saw me, even though I was like this little shadow following him around all the time. And so she got flown to Princess Alexandria and so I fly home. The matron actually was fantastic and bought my air ticket and I get home and Dad and I drove. And halfway here, uh, a truck went past and the windscreen, windscreen broke, so we had to wait and we started talking about Lois and I remember saying to him, but I'm here, oh yes, but you, you know, this girl has the spirit, this girl has the, and I'm going, but dad, I'm here. And then so in a period of 10 months, she was in a coma, had to learn to walk, talk, mm. everything again. And I have to say, it's really weird. I would never have recognised her if someone had shown me a photo because she had a head shaved and had brain surgery and all the rest. And I walked and was really shocked and I sat at the end of her bed and she opened her eyes and she was, you know, had a trachea, had, you know, nasal gastric and all the rest of the stuff and she just kicked me. And, yeah, and it was, it was weird, like... If she'd seen herself how she was prior to that accident, she would have said, because she was terrible. We'd go somewhere and there'd be someone, you know, with a, a different ability. Ah, they should be killed at birth, she'd say, and things like this. I mean, she was just awful. And it was like, so I started to go into, is this all payback? Is this mm. something I've done? Mm. Is this... So I went through that bit of torture stuff. Mm. But anyway, she um, defied the odds and... 
So 20 years I had this gregarious sister, then 20 years after I had another sister who needed looking after and needed protecting because people treated her appallingly because they thought she was some gum, like a parky in the long grass because she had quite a few strokes and used to get a bit right. with ataxia when she was tired. Yeah. So it physically impacted her intellectually. Did it impact her as well? It did. She was much slower in her speech. Yeah. And if she got tired, of course, mm. she couldn't. So, you know, me, I go, the Hilton is the place to be. Let's, let me dress you up. So here's this poor girl who gets out of hospital. She can hardly walk, talk. Uh, she's put Band-Aids all over her... Excuse me, I don't mean to be rude, but she's put Band-Aids all down below because she didn't know what her periods were. So I had to become the mother and do mm. all that because my mum was up home. So I decide the best thing for this is to take her to Juliana's, which was the trendy nightclub at the Hilton. Like, <laughs> hello. So, of course, we get denied entry. Mm. And I'm like, because he thought she was drunk. And I went, it's a black thing, isn't it? And so, yes. Mm. My anger for what happened to her, that poor bouncer, actually copped. Sorry, I hope it's... An, I don't mean no, to be boring and go on about it. Anyway. So you go from nursing... There's a turning point, Lois has the accident. What's, what's the turning point to go into the arts? Uh, well, see, now, Lois and I were booked on the Fedor Chalapano. You remember that boat? The Fedor Chalapino, Chalapano or something like that. It was a cruise ship. So she was going to be the hairdresser and I got a job as being the nurse mm -hmm. on board and we were going to travel Europe because she couldn't go because she'd had the car accident. So I decided I wouldn't go... And my father said, no, you need to live your life. So here I am in England, about to come home via India, and I go to a dinner party, fabulous, darling, you are in Sloan Square, and a friend of a friend of a friend was working with Bruce Beresford. And they were saying, when are you going back to Australia? I said, oh, in six months. And they went, we're working on this film. We're going to be looking at auditioning people. Um, because we've got this idea for a film, but the problem is, of course, there's no Aboriginal actors. And I went, what do you mean? There's Justine Saunders and Bob Mazza. So mm. I got onto this real tirade at this dinner party about Australia. And so, interestingly, by the time I returned home, that film was, it was... I'd only been back a few weeks, and they were auditioning for The Fringe Dwellers. Mm. Mm. So... The girl rang me and said, well, you were so vocal about this. Would you like to come for an audition? So you, I did. You did. Yep. And obviously couldn't act because I'd never done any acting. Um, but it was a fantastic audition because they said I looked far too European and no one would believe I was Aboriginal, so I simply couldn't get the role. But felt that what I did in the role was quite interesting. So they put me onto an agent, and that's literally how I got into the arts. And that agent then put me on to this amazing man, a Waramai man, a Birupai man from northern New South, uh, mid New South Wales, but by the name of Brian Siren, who'd been working for many years in New York and used mm. to teach the Stella Adler technique. And so that's where I went. And the first day I meet Ernie Dingo and Lydia Miller, and we were in his first class for that three-year program. Yeah. In the meantime, I'd moved back to Sydney and began to write and perform plays under the Aboriginal National Theatre Trust. Lois came a couple of times to see me in productions. Every opening night, Dad would never tell me, and I'd hear this... <laughs> at the funny bits, and there would be Dad... And I'd know Dad was out there, because then I'd get really incredibly nervous and think, oh, my God, and... He just grabbed me and he said, oh, now I get, now I see what you're trying to do. And he said, look, sister, the platform for us was the church. The platform for, you, for us now is the theatre. This is where we can tell our stories and we, we can have a voice and we can address, you know, the imbalances. So you go into theatre. One of the first theatre performances you do, you mentioned Lydia Miller. Um... And Rachel Mazza is Radiance. Um, and so you, the three of you are playing the three female characters. 
We Know Radiance Now is a, f a film that pe also starred Deborah Malman. How long do you spend in the theatre? Well, it was interesting because at the time, while we were studying with Brian, um, we went to the first National Black Playwrights Conference. And at that Playwrights Conference was Uncle Jack, the many of and these... And Brian does the... Brian, Brian puts, it, puts together it together with yeah. Justine Saunders. Yeah. But, and most of these people have passed, but there was mm. Hillis Maris, Women of the Sun, Jack Davis, uh, Kevin Gilbert, Bob Mazza, um, oh God, Ujiru Nunakul, um, Richard Wally, uh, the, the, just about 10 amazing, uh, Robert Merritt, amazing playwrights who'd written plays in Australia. At the end of that conference, they went, Lydia, Rhoda, Vivian Walker, who was Ujiru's other son, uh, Michael Johnson, uh, we want you to, in the next two years, you have to set up a theatre company, do three productions, incorporate it, and put on the second National Black Playwrights Conference. So they entrusted, they passed the baton. It's quite extraordinary. Lydia and I were both registered nurses, so we were working at night, night duty, mm -hmm. to run the company through the day, because we had no money, of course. So we quickly learned about submissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We did the productions. We put on the second play Black Playwrights Conference, and it was quite extraordinary, because this young man from Broome had sent us an envelope that was full of about 52 different types of paper. And then on each paper, whether it was blotting paper, A4, out of a writer's thing, all different sorts. I think there was even a serviette in there with the songs written on. And he rocked up the first day to the pl second playwrights conference and he opened the door and he said, hi, my name's Jimmy Chai and I'm a schizophrenic. And Lydia, went, Lydia and I both went, that's fine, we went into nurse mode. Anyway, during that two <laughs> week period, now have you got your medication? During that, and of course that was Jimmy Chai who had a band at the time mm. called Cuckles from Broome. So the second day of the playwrights conference, um, Lawrence Clifford, Kylie Belling, uh, Ernie Dingo, uh, Li um, Jimmy Little's daughter, Frances, and Vivian, Nana Walker, and Uncle Jack Davis, sat and Bri Brian Siren, sat around a table and went, right, here's the songs. And Kylie Belling could really sing really well, so her and Lawrence sang the songs. And in between it, they talked about what dialogue would occur between these songs. And at the end of the two-week period on the last night, Jimmy Chai stood there with his thing and he said, guess what? We've got a musical. Let's call it Brand New Day. Mm. Amazing. So the theatre for us was this incredible world. Mm. But of course, we kept getting the roles where we were the prostitute, the, you know, all the, the you know, hat talk like that, or, you know, I'm not going there, you know, we had to do all the yeah. Aboriginal roles. <laughs> and so Lydia and I saved our money. I think we had about $300. We saved our money and we said, why don't we get someone to commission a play? And so we went through the list and we're looking at all the stuff that David Williamson had done. And then we started looking at Louis Nauer and a few other playwrights. And at that particular time, Louis Nara had three productions on in Sydney. We went, he's a bit of flavour of the month, isn't he? And Jussie really knows him, so let's go approach him. So we went, hi, we want to commission you to write a play. It has to be about three women. You're not allowed to mention the word Aboriginal. And they're returning after 10 years for the death of their mother. And so over mm. a period of six months, it was fantastic because he had money. So every Friday night, we did every single restaurant on Glee Point Road. <laughs> he'd have his little dictaphone thing there and he'd just fire these questions at us. And so Nona mm. was written for me, Cressy was written for Lydia, and May was actually written for Kylie Belling. And we got her up, but she couldn't do the play. And we're going, oh my God, where's that third female? Justine refused to do it. She reckoned she was too old and it was for young ones. And Mind you, I was the oldest of all of them. And so we heard that Rachel Mazza had just graduated from WAPA. So we got her over. And like Lydia and I paid for this out of our own money. We just kept saving. And so Rachel came, and there we have it. It was Radiance, and we put it on at Belvoir Street, and it was a hit. That's 
amazing. Yeah, yeah so it's really amazing what, you know, theatre can do. You go into television? Yes. I went to audition. <laughs> I'd just finished doing a play in um, Tasmania and having an affair with Michael Mansell. The two went together, let me tell you. Anyway, <laughs> my father was horrified. He wanted me to go out with a nice young Aboriginal man. He didn't think I'd pick Michael Mansell, but anyway. <laughs> so I come back to Sydney. I've got to give it a bit of flavour. <laughs> come back to Sydney and there were auditions for a new program that SBS was putting on called First in Line. Meanwhile, over at ABC, a Tasmanian by the name of Jimmy Everett was putting together a unit there to train young cadet journalists. But SBS had Lester Bostock, and he'd been working there for quite a number of years. So they were a little bit ahead of the ABC training unit. And so um, they had auditions. So I went along to the audition, never been in front of a screen, except for that really bad audition piece. And so I went, okay, I'll read the order cue. Hi, I'm Rhoda Robertson tonight, that story. Because I thought I was doing my best yarn event impersonation. <laughs> And I got the job. I got the job, which and, was fantastic. And you went to the world of journalism. And, that, and I'd been working because, you know, the volunteering thing was still... So when I came to Sydney mm. as a nurse, I volunteered at Radio Redfern. And in fact, at that time, through Leichhardt Radio, Arnie Maureen Watson had managed to secure 12 hours. And then it went up to 20 hours. And so... Um, it was Tiger who actually taught me, Tiger Bowers, yes, yeah. taught me how to operate the desk. And the only rule was that Radio Redfern at that time was in the old Black Theatre um, building and the only rule was the gooms could not come in while you're on air. That was the mob drinking out in the front there. Right. But my cousin was one of those mob, Lenny, and so, Lenny Bolt. And so every time I came, I, you know, I'm a young kid, I'm terrified, There's, you know, I'm in Redfern. You know, you go to Redfern when you go to Sydney. And he'd protect me and bring me in and, you know, wouldn't let the others humbug me and stuff. So I had this experience in radio and, in fact, was working at ABC Radio from volunteering. They heard my work and offered me a job. But, yes, the television was... Country practice? Yes, I did a country practice. I played an Aboriginal woman who was a diabetic who went into a hypo, got violent... So they didn't realise that she was violent. No, they didn't realise she was a diabetic. They just thought she was a black gin going violent. Once again, stereotype. But it was a great experience. Mm. When's that? That's early 90s? Late, late 80s. 80s. Yeah, 90s. late 80s. Okay. Uh, you know, I did a lot of theatre and film and television until the mid-90s. And then I realised I'd get so sick and terrified and nervous before I go on stage that I thought, why am I putting myself through this? And I actually don't think I was that great. Mm -hmm. So that's where I went, you know what, I'm a really good organiser. Was there a highlight, though, throughout the acting career? I mean, I know you're very humble and... But was there something significant for you that stood out in terms of a production that you did? Yeah. Um, a I, film? Yeah, there were a couple of films I did. But <clears throat> I guess the thing for me was, can you imagine growing up, and, the, and we got a television when we were about 12 or something, in a little, and the only thing we were allowed to watch was This Day Tonight with Bill Peach and Pig in a Poke, because Pig in a Poke had Justine Saunders. So can you imagine, I'm watching her as a kid going, wow, she's so beautiful, I want to be like her when I grow up. And next minute, here I am, working on films with this... Oh, and of course, she mm. became a great mate. We had a mm. few drinks together, we had a good time. She became a really good mate, but... And a guide. And so we were very fortunate that myself, Justine, David Goldpalil, Ernie Dingo and Kylie Belling, along with the late Uncle Jimmy Little, were all... And Bart Willoughby, were all cast in a European film called... Until the End of the World, which featured Sam Neill, William Hurt, Max von Sydow, 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 Max von Sydow, Sydow. Sydow, there, and John Moreau and Sam Neill. And it was an amazing experience. But Leanne, the most incredible thing was in that film, we were out shooting past Alice Springs, the weirdest story, and Vim Vendors is like this 
eccentric European, amazing. And at that time, he was huge. Um, and it was a story of, in this little isolated Aboriginal community, they've worked out a way of running a system for this mad scientist where blind people will actually be able to see if they put on these particular glasses. So, <laughs> yeah, great storyline. <laughs> And Some kooky um, stuff happens out there. <laughs> of course, the people who worked this all out and worked with the two old scientists, Max and, and Jean Moreau, was the Erna, a whole group of women from Erna Bella. So they yeah. were in the film. And so it was an extraordinary time to actually go to your country but mm. sit with those ladies and have that opportunity of working with remote communities but also seeing how they approached the work. And again, it's that community obligation, it's that ceremony, it's that... So it was an incredible film in many ways, but really for all of us black fellas on that film, the honour of working with these really old... You know, there were some really senior law women there mm -hmm. and men. It was quite extraordinary. Mm. Judith, I think we might um, play some more images while we're still talking. Um, I want to get us through... Do you know I was 30 years old in that? That was Zoe what, Caridi's what, first. What film are we looking at here? Well, this was <coughs> Kadaicha Man, ah. which was a very B-grade film. Do, you, and of do course people know what Kadachi, mm? the Kadachi is in terms of Aboriginal people and culture? Well, it's Kadachi Man is in terms of law if someone within the community plays up, they will send a Gadachi man, or also known as Featherfoot, Featherfoot. Um, to basically come and sort you out. So I guess it's like sending the hitman out. Um, you don't know when he's going to appear. He can travel um, for many years searching, hunting you down, but one day he'll find you. That's it in a nutshell. So, uh, But it's quite interesting you say this because there, it wasn't that long ago there was an incident where a young man, wrong skin sort of situation, mm. and was sent to a juvenile justice set department in Adelaide, but had been sung, yep. and Featherfoot arrived, and they had scientists and doctors, and they couldn't work out why this guy had gone unconscious. Mm. And that's only mm. like, I think it was about 10 years ago or something like that, mm. quite incredible. Yeah, it's interesting too in terms of, um, you know, deaths in custody as well, I'm not saying, but suggesting... Mm. Um, you know, it's to do with Aboriginal law. But, you know, in conversations where I come from, because of my grandfather's country is on the bite of South Australia, and so we've got relationships up through Ernabella, the places, the, the Unangul, Pinjara, Yunkinjara lands, and um, so that's a part of our daily conversation, you know, is, is things like this. And, yeah, there's sometimes, you know, the conversation can turn to, you know, young people dying in custody mm. is whether there is a payback, who knows. I'm going to get skinny like that again <laughs> soon. <laughs> so through this, this acting career you meet Bill Hunter. Yes, in fact, I think I just, uh, oh, it was probably a few months after this film that I sort of started to look at Bill. How did you meet? I want to know the goth. Tell me about meeting Bill. Sean Scully, you know the actor Sean Scully? It was his birthday. I went to his birthday party and that's how I met Bill. But, <clears throat> and then we went on further to that place in Newtown, had a few more drinks, went further somewhere, 2 a.m. in the morning. I said, let's go home. And of course, he came home. And it was, um, it was interesting because Bill was very much a gentleman. He was from a different generation. We had 19 years difference between our ages, but that didn't matter. And in the morning, he was quite embarrassed. And I thought, oh, well, he's never going to want to see me again. And he was embarrassed because he was just such a gentleman. But Bill first met me when I was six years old because one of his best friends, a gentleman by the name of Gary Williams, who's a Gumbangi man from um, Barraville, they were best buddies. And, <clears throat> of course, during this period, Bill had gone with Gary Foley and the late Mac, um, Zach Martin and made a film called Backroads, and it was Phil Noyce's first mm, feature film. Yeah. It was on TV recently. Yeah. It? And so Gary, the two Garys, 
would often come to my father about advice or, you know, they loved my father. And so it was on a particular visit that they brought Bill Hunter with them. And Bill proceeded to say to me when we'd met and got married and everything that I was six years old, but I was running around under the sprinkler. <laughs> and that's how we <laughs> first met. Um, and so I was seeing a few people then. Um, and he came back and said, I want to court you. And that was quite interesting. Mm. And so we dated for about a few months. And then we moved in together. And then three years later, we married. And it was pretty amazing. And he was an incredible, incredible man, friend, companion. But he was an extraordinary man. A few people don't realise that he spent a lot of time in those early black theatre days with people. Um, mm. You know, he was very loved by the community, particularly the arts community, the Aboriginal arts mm. community. So we only um, tend to really see the person with their film and television history, but we don't see the person behind the scenes. And, you know, I think that if, if Australia really looked and dissected a lot of the creative minds that are out there, they're, they've got, you know, amazing long-term relationships, friendships, loves with, with the Aboriginal community. And, you know, one day I'd love to see more about looking at that, mm. you know. Um, Look, he was, an, mm. you know, Bill passed away. It'll be two years in May. And we'd split prior to him passing away. But, you know, the last words he told my brother-in-law and his bro my brother-in-law now my best friend, um, he had said that, and he told his brother John, that the period of time with me was a soothing period. And mm. that because we had Emily and, yeah, which was a really lovely thing to know that we were on his mind at that very late stage. And mm. yeah, we lost a great, a great man great when we man. lost him. You talk about Emily. Yes. Now, Emily is not your biological daughter. Emily is the daughter of Lois. Talk about how Emily came to you. So Emily is now 18 years old, but when she was uh, born, my sister rang me and it was a Tuesday saying, I'm about to have this baby and will you come and take the baby? And I said, absolutely not, I'm not having children, no. And my mother got on the phone and said, sometimes, Rhoda, it's, you're such a heartless girl. I am so surprised you ever were a nurse. <laughs> she never forgave me for giving up nursing and going into the arts. And, um, and I said, Mum, I'm not having children. I don't know. And she said, look, welfare have come in. They're going to take this child. If you were to have Emily, then Lois could be close. She can still see her daughter etc etc Lois prior to this um, had also had a son that my parents were raising um, Charlie who's three years older than Emily so of course you can imagine how I felt and then Lois got back on the phone and I begged me we used to call each other sissy and she begged mm. me and she said they're going to come and take her and of course with the history of kids going into other family situations etc and many were loved, but you know. So I traveled home. So we sat up all night and did a pros and con. And the next night I went into David Jones because I was living in Bondi Junction. It was just across the way. And went, nursery, I'll have that, 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 that. And so we went home and set up this nursery. And this is, is while you're still with Bill? This is Bill, yeah. yeah this was our, we had been married a year. And mm. I went home. And so Lois had had the baby. The baby was a couple of days old. Tiny as, because she'd drunk rum and coats and smoked yandy through the entire pregnancy. So the baby was just, and I don't mean that terribly, that was her way of coping, you know. Um, tiny. And so my mum, bless her, went through everything that you do as a mother. Thank God when I did my training, I did six weeks in the milk room, and did the midriff. So I actually went, okay, 
it's a four-hour regime. Mm -hmm. We'll just get this. And so I just went into nurse mode. And so here I am on the Friday, back on the plane with this tiny baby, absolutely terrified. No, you know, I wasn't a mother. I hadn't planned mm -hmm. anything. It happened in two days. And how blessed we were to have this amazing girl. And so Lois would come regularly and stay with us. Bill adored Lois. And... Um, Emily started to thrive and grow, and amazingly, and I always wondered about the nurture versus nature, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because on her first or second, third birthday or something anyway, she'd fallen over. Now, even when Lois came and stayed with us, she'd have a fabulous time, and I'd say, oh, Lo, because I'm working, right? I was working at SBS on a program called Vox Popoli. I was really busy. Bill was in between work. Actors don't get a lot of work, even someone like Bill mm -hmm. Hunter. So I was holding down about two or three jobs, quite exhausted, actually, and um, welfare kept checking up on us. Jesus. Oh, that's another story. And um, so Lois had come, and I go, great. Lo, could you just bath her tonight because I just need to do this? Oh, I can't bath her. Well, could you just change her nappy? Oh, I'm not touching her nappy. And so... Mm. I was doing everything for this child, even when her mother, her other mother, was there. And then Emily fell over, and she starts crying, and she comes running across our, this room. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, baby, straight to Lois, who'd never done a thing. Mm. And I watched them, and the way she jumped up into her mother's lap, and it was extraordinary. And it just, I just went... Of course, that's the bond, isn't it? That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So you become mother, and, and culturally, yes. for us, I've got, I've, I've had, um, I've got my sister's oldest daughter, who's nineteen, Kia. So it's my job now to grow her up. I grew her up as a baby. Uh, we went through university together, and now she's just got accepted into university. So next week she's off to uni and uh, living with me. So it's my role now that my sister's passed on, that I will grow her up as a young woman and get her through her university life. So it's not unnatural for mm. that sharing of motherhood. If you're the sister in our culture, you're also the mother um, of the children and um, on the disciplinary. So we have family conferences on the phone when the kids are pl all playing up and I'll call auntie and you answer to auntie. So, yeah, we do have a lot of, a um, lot to do in, ch in terms of child raising and juggling. And juggling. I mean, I, I, I want to go to the audience, Rhoda, and, and get people to ask you some questions before we, we wrap up. What an amazing career. You now, um, you know, you meet Stephen. Um, and you have a, a son and a daughter to Stephen. Um, Stephen is an amazing man and backbone to the work that you do. Watching you over the last 20 years is how do you juggle what you do? I mean, you're, you're going from nursing, you know, that 14-year commitment into acting and theatre and, you know, being the forerunner in those areas and to major events, the Dreaming Festival, the Olympic opening... Um, you know, you've got Clancestry happening. You've got Boomerang, which is a, a, a new event that's um, as part of the Byron Bay Blues Festival. You've got a number of irons in the fire. How do you keep going? How, where does this energy come from? One, I have an amazing partner and I'm blessed with three the most delightful, incredible children you could ever. For someone who wasn't going to have kids, man... I got the jackpot. Mm. But I come from a mum and dad and grandparents on both sides who instilled in us, just get over it, get on with it. Mm. If you want to do it, just do it. Don't wait for the government handout. Don't yeah. wait for this. You know what? You're so unique. You can be anything in the world. So we were constantly told how incredible we were as children bit too much possibly because we were shocked when we went into the real world and realised we weren't princesses. <laughs> but um, the thing I think that really strives me now 
is I've been blessed to work with some of the most astounding people in the Australian industry. Uh, you know, people like Deb Murphy, I can't tell you what a mentor. Mm. Uh, great, uh, fucking incredible, <laughs> amazing. I've had this opportunity, you know, I've just been lucky that these things have fallen in. And I go, how come I'm so lucky? There's got to be a reason. Because when my sister was murdered or when my sister had the car accident, I keep thinking, what did I do? Is this payback? What have I done wrong? And I go, you know, my father came from poverty. On Kabawi, it was shanty. When they knocked that down, you know, when he was a boy, they escaped by a boat from Cabbage Tree Island because the mission manager was a bad man. They did so much for us. Everyone who's gone before us or even around us have done so much so that Leanne and I can sit here mm. so proudly and he, like seriously talking about my life like, you know, really. And so I go, why have I been handed this? So my obligation as an Aboriginal woman, first and foremost, as a widgeable girl, is I have this thing. What am I doing with it? It's a vessel. I have the opportunity of working with knowledge keepers, whether it's Leanne or Archie Roach or, you know, Slip On Stereo, a great new band, you know, whoever mm. it is. And we have the opportunity to speak our language, to sing our songs, to do ceremony, do our dances, tell really contemporary stories, do whatever we want. The generation before me never had that opportunity. If we don't continue in the arts and we don't have our culture, under the government systems, whether it's some um, stronger futures in the territory with the intervention, or it's the closing the gap rhetoric, if we don't continue with culture, as the oldest living race, we won't have a culture in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the platforms that are there is about us exposing our voice. We want you to have the experience. The old ladies want you all to learn how to weave. The mm -hmm. men want you to know what a song line is, whether you're white, black or green, because they know we are Australians living on country. We are caretakers here. But I tell you this, if we don't pass on the knowledge, it's another form of assimilation. And in 20 years, oh yes, they all go to the football, don't even get me started. They've fallen into all the dominant society great things. But how many people will buy a ticket to come and see an Aboriginal show? How many people realise that our artists are lucky if they earn over 14 grand a year? Mm. They do it because they have this passion and soul and heart. They do it because they have responsibility to their communities, obligations to language and things that they've been, part, you know, that um, knowledge that's been passed. And so for me, it's like, okay, if you can help in any way of putting it out there, how blessed am I? What a luxury. I get to work with the most amazing people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm sorry. You can see I'm, I rave, but I'm but just so passion. passionate about that mm. because... It makes me sometimes just want to cry when I see our footballers who are beautiful, wonderful, amazing men, but they get wonderful, amazing wages and everybody will buy a ticket to the All-Stars, but we try and sell the black armband here for Saturday night with the most extraordinary lineup of not just only Aboriginal musicians, but some of Australia's greatest musicians come together mm. to sing in Aboriginal languages. Pretty amazing. Archie Roach, you know, this extraordinary man. Mm. And people go, why should I buy a ticket? So for me, the arts is about increasing employment for our artists, but also mm. making sure culture never dies, but culture is shared. So every Australian in 20 years will stand here and go, oh yeah, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I actually come from Bunjalung country. Mm. I want everyone to have the knowledge of why that mountain or that river or whatever. Mm. Because we're Australians, our landscape connects us. That's right. anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, thank Just God, aware a... that it's seven and we advertised it from six to seven. So if people feel they have to go, 
d no one will be embarrassed. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, but I think so people in the audience, there may be some people in the audience who would love to uh, ask a question. We'll take mm. just about five minutes of questions. Okay. Anyone would like to ask a question or comments? Tina. <laughs> There's a microphone just there, Tina. Yeah, no, so everyone can hear, you know. That was wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I proudly say I'm born on Kalkadoon country. Very proud. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts, Rhoda, where we are now in 2013. I work in the arts. I support independent artists. From your perspective, what's our biggest challenge? Like you say, we need, yes, we know that is the problem. I think you're in, a, as you say, a situation where you see things and hear things and work with people that I don't and maybe others. I'd love to know your perspective. What's our greatest challenge and help? Uh, yeah, okay. And Leanne might help out here yeah. too. And I might be a bit, this is why people hate me now. <laughs> okay. So I think we're on this incredible second wave. I think that first wave came in the 70s when we were seeing, you know, basically black and various other things on our networks and televisions. And sometimes I think we're a little bit ahead with the work we're doing to what we're doing now. I sometimes think we've become quite complacent with our plays, for example. You know, if you look at Cake Man and the various other things in the 70s, where's the play on the intervention? Mm -hmm. So, but I do believe, you think of, um, the Sapphires, Redfern Now, Brand New Day, in the film industry, because they've taken 20 years to nurture that industry and to provide funding to train up directors, producers, writers, etc., we're actually seeing a second wave of that first wave. And, you know, Redfern Now, people were tuning in not simply to watch an Aboriginal series. They were actually tuning in because it was a great series. series yeah, absolutely. So, and that's going into a second series. There's mm -hmm. Gods of Wheat Street coming out. I've got a series with ABC next year, Blood Sisters. So, you know, there's all this amazing stuff happening. So I think w when it's in the television screens and it's in our lounge rooms, great. We do need to get more people on the various home and aways. And, you know, I'm sure we could get someone on MasterChef. We need to have that visibility. But I do question our industry for two things. Um, and I'm you know, been res I've been, what's the word, I've done this myself and I had to go, hey, look, we need to look at the guard and when I think back of someone like Kevin Gilbert sitting in front of me going, I'm going to hand you this mantle. So we need to be constant, constantly aware there's this whole new blood coming up yep. and we need to, to allow their voice. Um, but I also think we need to tell the stories that are hard. Um, and talk about the taboos. And there's stuff that plays can do that's happening in our communities that when people see the mirror of society, it makes them think. Mm. So um, there's lots to do, but uh, Leanne, mm. you might wanna. Oh, look, I was in Canberra um, last weekend and, and if it tours, and I'm so hoping it does, The Secret River, mm. Sydney Theatre Company. Mm. Oh, an amazing, amazing story a sh and shared story. It was it's so... It's the connected histories. Absolutely. That's the future. Yeah. And I think what I can envis envisage is seeing a lot more of that collaborative work coming through. Um, it's certainly happening a lot in theatre, um, you know, with Belvoir really taking on. And, and it's not just about taking on Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander stories. It's also about what happens behind the scenes in theatre as well. You know, young Indigenous producers coming through, being mentored and trained um, right across the country. So, you know, in 20 years of me working in the industry, is that's why I work for Kākaua Youth Arts. It's about handing on those skills and um, making sure that, that, again, the next wave of young people are coming through. You can be a creator, but it's also about again, behind the scenes and the producers, young Indigenous people getting in, finding out those stories and getting them on the stages and on the television screen. But and anyway, the dancers, yeah. of course, as well. Yeah. Anyone else would like to make a comment? Anything they want to... Yes, gentleman in the middle. Hello, uh, Kane at Wano. I'm a proud Miriam man from the Miriam Nation. 
of the Torres Strait and uh, just acknowledging uh, Rhonda, you're an amazing, amazing black woman and mm. absolutely uh, inspiring. Um, and I think we can, I work with a lot of young people, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, non-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, but I think uh, when I, there's a young man who comes to mind, he's actually in the Sunshine Coast. We had, uh, we had 20 leaders, from across, 22 leaders, young leaders from schools across the state, from Bamaga Weepa, right in Brisbane. And this young man, he, I had to, they asked me to work on him one-on-one -on -one because he didn't fit in. And when I sat with him, you could tell this, this young man is talented. He had a major creative streak as part of his spirit. And he just loves it. He's, a, he's an artist. Mm. But the system is churning him. It, it doesn't support that process. The system, to about leadership, they look at other academic processes and then support his, his strength. And I think if we're looking at really blossoming our Indigenous artists, we really need to start with the education system and get into young folk and saying, hey, it's okay. Grow this mm. within you. And I'm spending time with him. I brought him down to look at the play um, Up the Ladder. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just to acknowledge that, you know, there's, a, there's another world which we must embrace. Absolutely. So certainly yeah. I think we talk about leadership, but we're looking at a leadership model which, which sort of alienates people. And we're not, we're not growing that, that energy. And that's stifling. Mm. And I make sure all my kids, they just feed off of arts, mm. the dream. You take away the dreaming, you take away the very essence of our existence. You take away storytelling, mm. we don't exist. Mm. That's right. And I think the Woodridge incident, the racial incident, and I was here yes last night with the, the talk, you turn that into a play. You tell that story from both angles and then you can actually create some healing but get young people themselves to be involved in telling that story. So the world's the oyster, but certainly I think we need to re-examine the, the, the education constructs and we're, we're pushing people towards areas which they don't want to go. Yeah. And they feel like they're being let down and they feel ostracised. Yep. And this young boy felt he just didn't belong. Mm. But also just to acknowledge the tremendous inspiration oh, that you, you provide. Thank you. So just, and may my ancestors and their spirits just walk behind you and support you oh, because you. I think we need more Rhonda Roberts. And hopefully oh, there's mm. more There are. There's through. lots out there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very okay. much. Well, I'd like to say thank you oh, to no, Rhoda. Yeah, thank you, And darling. Um, it's always good to have a conversation. I would hope that people would... I think there is... We're going to have a post-drink. Come and join us. Uh, have a glass of wine with us and um, look forward to saying hello to you in a more sort of informal setting. I just love this song. Thank you. I did um, New Year's Eve and we used this song. Oh, I just love it. Thank you. Thank you.